a very good morning to one and all uh, i am kunal walecha from document 360 uh, your co-organizer of the session we are all very thrilled to have you amongst us uh, today for this webinar on the topic uh, preparing content for the future of self-service uh, without taking much of your time i will introduce our speakers for the day we have a special guest speaker jason christie uh, he is from shopify uh, he uh, just a quick few words about him he is the founding member of shopify's documentation team and as a leader he has led a team of writers and other leads to deliver world-class content uh, a content property with incredible traffic he champions projects that span large amount of time and involve contributors from a variety of departments he coaches and develops individual contributors and other leaders to unlock their potential and as a technical writer he consistently produces clear and concise documents tailored to user specifications he excels in a creative environment that requires attention to detail and uh, he enjoys transforming technical concepts and complicated ideas into plain, simple language. I think that's a pretty impressive profile, Jason. We welcome you to this webinar and thank you for accepting our invitation to share your thoughts uh, with our in wonderful audience that we have here. And quickly, we have Selvaraju, who is a data strategist from Kovey.co, a SaaS company. He is, uh, he's completed his uh, master's from, from Lathrop University in Australia. He also has a doctorate in computational mathematics from the same university. His interests are in documentation, technical writing, and data analytics. Yeah, so I will now hand over the screen to Jason uh, so that he can start his presentation. Uh, his presentation will be for about 25 minutes, followed by which Selva will talk to you all about the artificial intelligence part of side, and then there will be an interesting conversation between the two of them, uh, after which we will take a couple of questions from the audience. Thank you so much, and over to you, Jason. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Kunal. It's my pleasure to be speaking to you today. Um, I hope I'm on screen and coming through clearly. I'm grateful to Document360 and, uh, and our hosts for providing this opportunity. I hope you will find some of what we will cover useful or interesting. Uh, Kunal gave a, a great introduction to who I am, but uh, I'll go over uh, a few more of the details. My name is Jason Christie. I'm a technical writer and leader with over 15 years of experience. I've had many roles from solo writer to consultant to part of a large team of writers to managing a creative department and now leading a great team of technical writers at Shopify. I'm passionate about technical writing and especially about product documentation and the role it plays in a user's experience of products. As a leader, I follow a leading with intent model based on making sure my writers have the clarity and competency to have the autonomy to do the job that they know they need to do. Shopify operates on a continuous deployment model, which means my team needs to stay informed, plugged into what's coming up, and they can't be burdened with too many administrative processes or tooling that slows them down. My team exists in a self-service organization alongside teams that build video content, manage the forums, and work to localize the product experience. And that is what I'm here today to talk to you about, self-service, particularly as it concerns knowledge bases, help centers, and product documentation. My bias will be towards supporting SaaS products, but I hope there will be interesting information for everyone. The thread that we will be picking up will be where AI fits into all of this. If you search technical writing and artificial intelligence, the results can be quite scary. <laughs> there were a lot of articles written over the last couple of years about how AI would take our jobs. We now know that when left to its own devices and without a proper understanding of how content is one of the most important elements of successfully using AI, well, AI can go down a really uncomfortable path. 
whether it's an embarrassing chatbot or information that is not even remotely relevant. AI will be a powerful tool for helping us to write better, and it will also take our content to new and unexpected places. But before we get into all of that, let me walk you through our documentation journey at Shopify that has led us to this place of exploration and experimentation. When I started at Shopify, we had a wealth of content in a wiki that everyone at the company, from the CEO to a customer support agent to a designer, could add to. As you can imagine, this led to wildly inconsistent voice and tone, useful information that was buried and difficult to find, and an AI that appeared more cobbled together by happenstance than intention. Our small team of technical writers reviewed all of that content, organized it, cleaned it up as best we could, and migrated it to a newly built help center. The help center was a static site that was powered by Jekyll. We wrote in Markdown, we used Git to push our changes to GitHub, and we used GitHub to deploy our content to the help center. That's a pretty typical docs as code setup. Docs' code comes from the book Docs Like Code by Anne Gentle, and I first heard about it uh, through the Write the Docs community. It's a great book and a great approach for creating a shared experience between technical writers and developers. There's a lot to it, but essentially it means following the same processes as developers, using the same tools and the same workflow, and treating your content like code. While we were thrilled by the speed with which we could develop and publish content, we started to find that we were struggling with complexity, especially around reuse and single sourcing content. We used something called includes, but the folder structure where they were stored was a mess. It was impossible to navigate. At the time, we also could not easily localize or translate our content. We explored several possible options and landed on rebuilding the Help Center as a Rails app that would allow it on the back end to connect into our translation platform at Shopify. In order to move quickly, and because we really liked the Docs as Code approach, we decided to preserve that workflow. Fast forward a few years, we're still using the same tools and workflow, but we're actually enjoying very few of the benefits due to limitations and constraints beyond what Docs as Code prescribes. Our use case grows more and more complex and requires more and more involvement from developers to keep it running. Mm -hmm. And this has led us to begin questioning our, questioning our approach and looking around for other options. In the past, we reviewed and evaluated several possibilities and decided data and an authoring tool would set us up for success. At the time when we first tried to implement DITA and an authoring tool, we were focused on the benefits for our team, the reduction in pain and frustration for our writers, and that is certainly a big part of why the move makes sense. We knew there were benefits to the business too, but beyond reducing translation costs and unlocking proper localization, we struggled with articulating them. As a result, we faced an uphill battle as we tried to explain DITA to everyone and what an authoring tool would bring to the table. Fast forward a few more years to the present, and we find ourselves exploring DITA again for all of the reasons we identified before. However, we know now that the path to a truly incredible self-service experience depends upon structured content. It appears what's old is new again. I remember trying to convince my boss in 2007 that DITA was the way of the future. It's a great framework, but with the advent of AI, structured authoring frameworks like DITA are becoming even more relevant and necessary. Structured authoring satisfies the conditions that make AI successful. And we'll get back to that a little bit later in the webinar. One of the most significant reasons we've identified that we need to get our content ready for AI at Shopify is that we believe it will play a huge role in shaping the future of self-service and therefore effectively scaling support. At Shopify, we value entrepreneurship. It's a vital aspect of commerce and the offerings that make up self-service suit the entrepreneurial mindset. Entrepreneurs love to roll up their sleeves 
love to figure it out. They love to use the tools available to discover how to succeed. They didn't phone or email someone or chat with a chatbot even to set up their business. Self-service arms every customer who decided to give it a shot with the information, educational material, and tips and tricks they will need to find their way. With the ability to understand users and combine or create content in real time in response to a variety of inputs, AI will provide countless opportunities to reimagine the relationship between product and product documentation. Self-service will be a core part of product experience and will be critical to your product or services success. The only thing stopping companies from exploring these opportunities to differentiate themselves is preconceived notions about support and self-service. So having said that, uh, self-service needs to change. When we talk about self-service, we're talking about the resources that your users will visit to try to find answers to the problems and to educate themselves so they can benefit from using your services or products. Self-service includes videos, webinars, community forums, knowledge bases, help centers. My bias is toward discussing help centers, but the ideas are broadly applicable. Self-service, if it is even a thing that your company values, will often live in a support organization which is traditionally viewed as a cost center to the business. Most companies look for ways to minimize that loss and squeeze every penny out of optimizing live service. There seems to be a general awareness that self-service is important, but it is usually less of a focus and at worst, an afterthought. Right now, most self-service experiences are disjointed. Users visit multiple sites that use similar but often different language to describe the same topics. Often the steps shared in a community post, video, webinar, course, or knowledge base do not match. After failing to find the answer using a self-service resource, hopefully users will contact customer service and in most cases will get another different version of the same material. The result is a loss of trust in your organization and a loss of confidence as they attempted to find the solution themselves and failed. Your organization does not appear consistent between the experience of using your products or services and the experience of engaging with support. This is the worst kind of problem to have because the cumulative effects of it will hit your bottom line, but you won't be able to trace the incident to a specific time or a specific release Instead, your users will slowly stop using your products and services. By the time the problem becomes clear, the path to recovery might be already lost. Preparing your content for use with AI has the added benefit of gathering all of your source material into a single source where it can be updated once and pushed or pulled to whatever resource needs it. Across every front, self-service and live service, your users are now getting a consistent message and their trust in your company and confidence in themselves is increasing. A study in the Harvard Business Review identified that fully 81% of all customers attempt to take care of matters themselves before reaching out to a live representative. Anyone who has tried to call a person under the age of 40 will know how upset it can make people to talk on the phone. Even texting or chatting is becoming frustrating. The benefits of self-service to the business are well known. Reduced support costs from anywhere around $7 or more per interaction to around 10 cents. Increased time on platform, higher overall satisfaction. But we are starting to realize there are substantial benefits for users too, as demographics shift from users who want to connect with a person to solve their problem to users who prefer to find the answers themselves, whether that's generational or just because of who they are. AI promises to revolutionize the way knowledge flows from an organization to a user. A Google search will provide you with numerous articles and companies who guarantee all manner of business results from AI. In reality, we are training a generation of users who search first. They don't start at page one, as Mark Baker would say, every page is page one, but they don't even want a page. They want the answer that they need. They weren't raised to read a table of contents, 
to flip through a manual with the assurance that the information they need will be there if they could only find it. They are not habitually used to scanning an index for a topic they need to find. They enter terms in a search bar in a browser window on a computer or mobile device. If they don't get the result they want, they search again with different terms. If my children's use of digital assistance is any indication, then soon they won't even type what they would like to find. They'll just shout at a speaker from across the room. <laughs> Knowledge bases are largely built on top of an IA that closely matches a manual. We have a static IA, we present a fixed navigation that maps to it in some way that we hope models a user's interest based on our research. But for a generation raised on an internet designed to reward the search, apps that anticipate and satisfy curiosity, the cognitive load of landing at the top of a dense page of material or having to click around to find the right resource is massive. The entire time they are hunting around looking for clues to follow to the content they need, your organization is burning their trust and increasing their displeasure. We need to rethink the way we provide self-service. It can no longer be based on the model first introduced by Clarence Saunders over a hundred years ago in his grocery store, where users walk through a static display of what's available and try to use signs to find what they need. The tolerance for browsing is low. Self-service needs to be proactive, but we also have to anticipate our users' needs and meet them where they are before they even know they need help. The best support is the kind a user doesn't even know they are relying upon. The best support feels like the experience of using a product or service. Perhaps this means our content travels beyond our knowledge bases and starts to appear elsewhere. Maybe in marketing content like blog posts, maybe in contextual help in your product or in app help. Self-service, especially product documentation, is a crucial part of the product experience. If we begin to think of product documentation and products or services as a system, then we can discover many ways in which the two can create feedback loops and flywheels to drive business goals. So how do you do that? Well, as a technical writer, I am biased, so I believe content is key. <laughs> it's critical. So let's talk a little bit about where content fits into all of this. Content in knowledge bases and help centers often ranks very high in search engine results. With a good understanding of SEO, we can ensure that that remains the case. But fundamentally, content in knowledge bases and help centers satisfies the core requirements of the crawlers that determine where pages rank on search engine results pages. No matter what Google does to try to break the attempts of SEO wizards gaming their system, most knowledge bases and help center content would be fine because it is updated frequently, receives a high amount of traffic without needing too much manipulation. It usually benefits from link backs and it's strictly or loosely structured in a way that makes it clear to the crawler what each page is about. And it often has accurate metadata because technical writers are very meticulous. Our help center enjoys a massive amount of traffic with high performing content and our discussion of where self-service could go to advance business goals, we can start to see a case for working with AI become clearer. Admittedly, uh, current uses for AI are somewhat limited. I think there's a lot of exploration that's going on and some very interesting experiments are occurring. Chatbots are cute, they can be useful, but they're only as good as the information they can access. Many AI projects will fail because content is treated as an afterthought. Teams rush to build their technological solution without understanding that code isn't what makes AI successful. A user can admire all the bells and whistles afforded by a technological solution, say a chatbot that uses AI, but if they are not finding what they need, if the information is not useful, credible, reliable, and presented in a way that makes sense, the quality of that interaction swiftly diminishes. The secret to making sure content is all of the things I mentioned, useful, credible, reliable, reasonable, depends entirely upon making sure it can be developed, maintained, and updated easily. Your tooling and content strategy should make it as easy as possible for writers to do what they do best. 
In the situation I described where a tech solution is rushed and content is an afterthought, the hallmark for this kind of thing is that it's difficult to develop, manage, and update content because there was a fundamental lack of understanding by the team as to what makes AI great. The result will be well-designed, but mostly useless, and will degrade over time as it becomes more and more difficult to maintain. People will start auto-closing the chatbot bubble that pops up because they know it won't satisfy their needs. So let's talk a little bit about the opportunities that could exist if we were to embrace AI and start working with it. We know what AI use looks like today. We've all landed on that website. As I mentioned, the chat bubble pops up asking, how can I help you? It's the modern day equivalent of Clippy, if you remember that from Microsoft Office many, many years ago. Magical sounds. It looks like you're writing a letter. I'm in the minor minority of people who actually liked Clippy. It wasn't bad. It had elements of the proactive support we've been talking about, but it was easily confused, laughably sincere, and obviously had no intelligence of its own. What are some of the things that properly structured content stored in a machine readable format and accessible location could unlock? For one, we could imagine self-service occurring outside of traditional support channels. Self-service is really about increasing a user's ability to use your product or service. Self-service resources connect knowledge to ability, empowering your users to not only learn but to do the thing they need to do in the moment that they need to do it. There's no waiting on hold. There's no joining a queue, hoping that you get into a chat. You read it, you should be able to do it. So imagine a future where we know what plan a person is on that you offer. We know what features they might have enabled. We even could know what potential issues they've encountered based on the configuration of the product or service that they're using. And now imagine we can dynamically introduce help content curated to match their unique experience of our product based on their current needs. And that wouldn't be manual. That would be an AI understanding the data that's come in to your system and using that to find the content that the user needs in the moment. So when a user searches for something and they arrive at your knowledge base or help center, the AI serves up exactly what they were looking for. They read about a feature they haven't enabled yet. Maybe without leaving the page, they can turn on that feature. When they return to your product settings, it's already enabled. It's ready to go. If there was data they had to enter, they could do it while reading the steps to do so. When they return to the product, the data is populated, the feature is enabled, and they're ready to go because your documentation and the product are all part of the same system. An AI bot makes sure they know maybe what they've decided and handles the switching between product and documentation. It understands the user and the product that they're using or service that they're using. So hopefully what we've done now is met their needs without them having to do a lot of tab switching, searching, reading, or even decision-making. Structured content, especially using a framework like DITA, ticks the boxes on all the requirements to make AI powerful. Beyond that use case, structured authoring with an authoring tool and CCMS provides many other benefits, as we know, like single sourced and easily reused content, easy localization, reduced translation costs. But going a step further, we could imagine single sourced content populating in frontline support tooling, maybe with a bot analyzing and providing the right content at the right time, just like it would for a user. The most important point is that the content the AI is providing is developed, maintained, and organized by a team of writers so it will be consistent, useful, and trustworthy. Now your customer support agents are working from the same page without having to go digging or hunting through several internal resources to find the source of truth. And what they are telling your customers aligns with what your customers are reading in the support documentation or in their experience of your product. So that concludes my uh, presentation. Um, I'd like to hand it over to Selvaraju to tell you a little bit more about how DITA and AI will work together. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Um, just to summarize, I think, Jason, you clearly mentioned about there's a shift in how the 
audience or the consumers actually looking at the documentation. It's definitely a sh change in shift, shift in consuming documentation. They, the modern uh, generation, they want to access documentation uh, anywhere, anytime, in any format, in any device. As simple as that. So if I have a tablet, probably I'll type. If I have an Alexa, I would rather ask rather than typing. So definitely there's a clear shift in um, the, the way the product documentation is being delivered. That's one clear uh, thing. And the other one you talked about is trust. You talk about credible information, and that's very important for an artificial intelligence to win over the human trust. If the information that they provide is not credible or reliable, obviously people will stop trusting AI which leads to the failure of all the projects. That was, uh, that was an amazing kind of uh, uh, insight. And the third one you talked about is in terms of uh, scaling support. Definitely, as your business grows, you cannot provide that one-to-one -one personalized support because the human resources are very expensive when you scale. Obviously, there has to be some kind of an artificial intelligence agent that can come and simplify that in terms of reducing the cost. Obviously, your support can scale. Uh, um, that was an amazing kind of an observation um, as well, Jason. Let, let's try to move on what an AI can do in this space. So, as J Jason mentioned clearly, the document, the content is the key. For an artificial intelligence to learn about uh, things, data is the raw material. In this context, the data comes from the text. Okay, uh, most of the documentation you see, it's all covered with text. Of course, there's a lot of picture, uh, graphical representation as well, but an AI, an artificial intelligence needs to understand those kind of things. So over the year, what we actually found was when you try to write uh, author a content for a product documentation, it's usually the technical writers, they have this uh, understanding of producing content which suits the human needs, because they know at the, at the other end is a human who is actually trying to read the content. So most of them are very human centric in nature. But what we see is a shift in paradigm where there is a, the technical writers needs to take into account for a machine to machine interaction as well. So which means the content has to change slightly, okay? So that a machine can understand the content and it can translate that content to a human in a very natural language, okay? Uh, to give you an example, let's say, there is some kind of a thing you need to configure in your product, okay, in a software product that you have, or it could be a hardware product, just like a Nest thermostat, or it could be a washing machine that you have. So obviously, they'll be asking a few questions. How do I set my temperature in my Nest? Um, so which means, if you look at it, a machine has to go and understand that content that you have in your documentation, and then have to understand the context when you're asking, and then bring out the relevant kind of an article and then try to um, that ingest that data and then actually give you the right answer, okay? Um, in a human, in a very natural language that human can actually understand. So there's definitely a, a shift in way uh, the content has been tailored for machine-to-machine -machine interaction. Of course, the machine-to-machine -machine interaction and then a machine-to-human interaction. That's where this, uh, artificial intelligence, there's a technology called natural language understanding, is actually gaining a lot of traction these days. And chatbot is one of the use cases of that, okay, natural language understanding. Um, you probably heard that acronym NLU. It is ability for uh, an artificial intelligence to actually understand the language context and then provide the answers for the humans to understand, okay? So how do we do that? So in terms of how, so when you produce a content, obviously you need to provide a lot of rich metadata associated with the content so that um, the metadata is not served to the human. It is, uh, when I talk about metadata, let me give you the definition. Metadata means data about the data. Okay, you provide a description about what the content is all about. Okay, it's very, very useful for a machine to actually understand the context and also produce relationship between different concepts. Okay. And to give you an example, Jira is perfectly 
kind of positioned in that way where you, you can actually provide those kind of rich metadata associated with that. For example, trans translation, localization attributes, even you can actually add a few custom attributes to some of the documentation you provide, and that is only consumed by the machine. I mean, when I say machine, it's by a chatbot or an AI bot. So how does how does a natural language understanding engine actually work? So to understand the context, the the natural language understanding kind of an engine needs to scan through the rich metadata and then trying to associate the content. This is where the taxonomy and the ontology comes into picture. Um, so talk about taxonomy. Taxonomy is all about classification of objects in a very hierarchical way for example let, let me talk about for example um some kind of a moving vehicle a moving vehicle could be a car it could be a bus or it could be a truck okay um, and this is what a taxonomy is all about the concepts and how they're actually hierarchically placed in terms of classification okay and in terms of ontology it talks about relationship between those two kind of concepts Okay. It could be, uh, you can think about a taxonomy and ontology as uh, in, in the product sense, for example, a product will have a product set of features and the features will have set of functions. Okay. Uh, and if you look at product features, um, functions, they are part of taxonomy and ontology is what the relationship between them. For example, a, pro uh, a product could uh, enable a, a feature, a product feature. Okay or you can derive a sub feature from a, a modern feature you see that understanding of the relationship and that's the ontology and for a natural language understanding engine to actually understand the context of your content this taxonomy and ontology plays a, a crucial role and how does a, an ai understand this taxonomy and ontology through a rich metadata and this is where the data comes in place where you, as a technical content writers, we might also need to write meta description about the content we actually produce so that the machine can actually scan through it and then probably build this taxonomy um, behind the scenes. So what does it actually help us to do? It, it provides the ability for our audience or end customers to actually ask a natural, have a natural conversation with our documentation product and can interact ask questions and get accurate answers uh, in return. So it's a natural way of uh, um, interacting with the products and services uh, we write documentation for. And, uh, and, I be, and we fundamentally believe that the rich metadata you provide, the more uh, rich your taxonomy and ontology is, and obviously it helps the natural language understanding engine to uh, ingest that data and then produce a, a good kind of a hierarchical uh, a map of your documentation and then help us to answer the questions okay so um so the main uh, and, um, theme of understanding this ontology and taxonomy is this relationships they're very crucial to know what is driving what Okay. It gives you like a cost and effect or what is what is the parent one and how it's been derived. Okay. That relationship is very crucial for us to, for a natural language understanding uh, engine to ingest your content and produce that. And, and the amazing thing about this, uh, this ML, the natural language understanding is that it's not only able to reason, but it can also generate new information based on the content you have over the period of time, the natural language understanding engine can actually learn and can generate a new kind of sets of um, information for, for uh, your users, okay? And that can be vetted. There can be a human in the loop uh, in the kind of an equation, but over a period of time, an AI gets better as you feed in more kind of content to it. So this is where this uh, concept of knowledge graph comes in and is an emerging natural language understanding field. And this is, this is um, about 
building that kind of a relationship and ensuring that um, your um, the relationships are being strengthened and your content is actually helping to um, build new relationships as well okay and guess what as a technical writer building content for machines to understand this semantics is important than ever you just cannot produce content you have to provide rich metadata and you have to help the machine to understand the relationships and semantics uh, by doing so what the knowledge that enables us to do is you can actually answer complex questions because as a technical writer you cannot answer all the questions we can talk about configuring multiple things but what happens if you try something and didn't work obviously there is some kind of a gap a knowledge gap exists in your a knowledge base that's exactly where this knowledge that actually comes in and try to plug in the gap for us and more importantly for an ai if you look at it everybody needs a red carpet welcome everywhere just not for the celebrities um, everybody needs a red carpet and through ai you can provide that red carpet customer service to your customer which is very personalized and contextualized okay um, based on as jason mentioned you can if there's more personalized information can be gathered and you can actually tell with the content and let's say they're talking about some feature in your product which they haven't actually enabled then the AI should be able to understand guess what your license plan is limited if you upgrade you can do that it should give you that or if you already paid for it and you're not using it let's say you ask the AI it says you know what you already paid for it you haven't actually configured you want me to configure for it for you so it provides a kind of a personalized help and helps you in kind of navigating the nuances in configuring those things in a very natural way uh, instead of reading a bunch of documentation configuring it's as said as jason said it's an old paradigm the modern uh, gen z gen y they are they want the information very fast and if it's done in a more seamless way through an ai they prefer that because time is a luxury okay and they want to use the time for uh, things that actually matters to them so in terms of the technical documentation uh, this is a slight change in the shift in customer behavior and only an ai can help us in uh, solving this kind of a problems uh, look, that's pretty much what i have um, in terms of my slides and there are a few resources that jason actually put together a um, um, few books and few resources um, we will be sharing this slide deck with you after the webinar and you can actually access these resources and then there are like five links given to that and one of the good book uh, that jason recommended was this ai powered enterprise but um they said and he said there's no uh, artificial intelligence without information architecture so that shows the importance of taxonomy and ontology without information architecture there's no ai there is no natural language understanding of the content uh, which means um for for the newer audience coming at a scale to using our products and services, we can't provide the personalized support without AI. Uh, with that, I pretty much uh, um, uh, would like to have some kind of a conversation with Jason because uh, he's given us a lot of insights from the Shopify, um, how they're actually looking at uh, content. Let me uh, ask uh, Jason. Jason, you talked about uh, um, um, the docs is the code, how it actually evolved. And you also talked about um, thinking uh, documentation as data. Uh, so what's the difference between, um, can you elaborate on what's the difference between doc as a code and docs as a data? Yeah, sure. And uh, and thank you for those, uh, those slides where you walked through what AI actually is and does. Yeah. Um, the uh, the doc says data. I I can't claim any any uh, ownership of it. Wasn't my idea. It's a great idea. I love the term. Um, how I found out about it. I attended a talk by Ryan Paul, uh, who who was at Stripe, um, at Write the Docs Portland conference in 2020, and uh, and he he his presentation um, dealt with. How to, how to have your documentation be more like an application. And so uh, they talked about how they extended their Markdown compiler to enable some things like client-side interactivity. Um, and that was all sort of predicated upon 
having their content stored in a database. So it was it was accessible. It could be pulled into uh, into applications like data could essentially. Um, and that really kind of got my imagination going. I got very interested in that idea. Um, I think there were a few more talks at the conference that also dealt with um, the idea of documentation as data. Ryan uh, was one of them. There's also, I think, Luke Perkins um, who talked about it as well. And, and they mainly talked about having that rich metadata uh, attached to um, your documentation. But the, yeah. the main sort of um, premise of it is that uh, we need to go from thinking of documentation at a page level and start thinking about it at a content uh, chunk. It's not a great term, but like a componentized sort of uh, a way of understanding it um, so that that metadata, metadata won't travel just with the page. It'll travel with the individual pieces and they can be reassembled in real time as needed um, and understood by machines. Yeah, that's that's great, uh, Jason. Jason, uh, you, uh, so in terms of technical writers' capability to adapting to this kind of new paradigm shift, what what are your thoughts on the capabilities that a technical writer need to possess or need to develop uh, just to tailor the content or suitable for AI? Uh, what are those capabilities you you have? Um, yeah, you mentioned that great quote from uh, Seth Early's book, uh, There's No AI Without IA. So I think an understanding of information architecture is is important. Um, that's kind of always been true of, of technical writing. Um, but mm -hmm. something I'm noticing is that more and more technical writers are comfortable with code. So at, at, at the very least, they can read it and understand it. Um, many of them can actually like do coding themselves and build applications or, or build uh, websites. Um, and I think that's going to be a fundamental skill for technical writers going forward, especially as we start talking about um, AI getting involved or, or having uh, more application-like features and knowledge bases. Um, one of the things I remember when I first started as a technical writer was that I was writing everything in Microsoft Word. <laughs> <laughs> formatting it, making it look yep. really pretty in my document pretty. and then I would yeah. yeah and then I'd hand that doc set off to a developer who would then have to try and interpret my formatting put it into HTML and then uh, publish it into a help center and at the time I knew like a little bit about HTML CSS and building web websites and web pages but I realized if I just took over that step I could speed things up I could prioritize my content and, and getting it to market much faster. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I learned how to how to do all of that and started building out the um, the help site myself and and publishing it myself. So all I would hand off to the developer was a zip file of all of the the um, code that they would need and the content, and then they would just deploy it for me. So um, that's a that's sort of like an old time version of, of where I think we need to go. If we're at a place where we can actually uh, have our content stored in a database um, and we understand the benefits of building an application to run it, we can do that ourselves. We can make that pitch to the business. We could propose all kinds of um, different applications uh, that would build on that that content repo. Um, so I think like that's that's definitely something I see. Like we're going to need to be more comfortable coding and. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think we're also going to have to be more comfortable talking to the business about the benefits that we can bring beyond just deflection or, um, you know, to helping support scale. There are definite opportunities with the business too. Yeah, absolutely, Jason. Just just to add on to that, I think uh, the, the other skill they might need to create the data. They have to have a. They need to treat content as data. I mean, which means if the text and images, everything is treated as data, then they have a different view of how the machines treat, because for a machine, every text is a data point. It's as simple as that. And how do you enrich that data is really what matters uh, in the future in terms of serving all this AI capabilities. Okay. Look, I, I know the future is exciting. Um, so can you give me a glimpse of what the future of documentation would be? Where are we heading? What's the exciting thing about the future? Yeah, that's a, that's a big subject. It's uh, it's exciting. It's something I love to to sort of imagine. Uh, so um, I think we touched on it a bit in the slides in our conversation, but um, 
I think the future of documentation, no matter how it manifests, is going to be dynamic. I think um, when we think about, again, like my bias is like, SaaS uh, companies, so the product and the documentation are both digital. So to have them live in separate places, um, you know, just just kind of doesn't make sense. Or to have them not be a system that's integrated um, when they're both digital, they're both available sort of online, um, doesn't make too much sense. So I think like as an industry, we're still thinking like we're creating BCRs. Uh, so the engineers and designers believe that if they have the right buttons, the right labels, the right technology in place, people won't need to read the manual. Um, but I, I think that's largely hubris. Uh, it's not. It's not. It's not true. I think the pool of people who don't know how to use your product or service will always be larger than the pool of people who do. And so if you're just limiting yourself to the people who get it without needing to have a little bit of help, um, yep. you know you're just leaving money on the table. Uh, and worse than that, you're actually, I think, creating an opportunity for your competition to come in and eat away at that pool of people who don't know how to use what uh, what you're providing them. Yep, absolutely. So, absolutely. yeah, I think like, when, when I think about that, I think of like things like client-side interactivity, like when we talk about integrating documentation and product, um, you know, you mentioned it and in, in, in my slides, I talked about it, but like uh, the idea that as you're reading something, you can just do it and it's, mm -hmm. It's it's automatic. It's because you're you're yeah. system, you're thinking of it as a system. Yeah. Um, and then the the personalization you mentioned, especially like the red carpet, I think is a great example, a great great way to de to describe it. I think people, um, you know, it's 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 not that we need to do everything for them. It's more that we want them to be doing what they need to do or want to do, and we want to be helping them to get there. So we don't want them spending a lot of time poking around in documentation. Like, you know, we don't want them to go get a coffee and, and enjoy reading our articles so much that they'll just click the next one and the next one and the next one. That's not our yeah. business model. Like that's a blog. That's a, like there, there is a place for that kind of right. content, certainly. Correct. But, yeah. um, and, but so speed, like getting them back to what they need to do and staying with them on that journey from your product or service into the documentation, however that happens, and then back to the product. I think uh, I think that's important. Um, but lastly, like like I said uh, in, in earlier, the watching my children use technology I think reveals all kinds of opportunities. <laughs> so voice search I think will be huge as our screens get smaller and the place where we do business or engage with products and services gets smaller. Um, you can imagine shouting to your digital assistant, like, how do I do this thing? And you're on your phone trying to do something truly complicated. Um, and then the assistant says, you know, here's how you do that. Would you like me to enable it? I'm like, yeah, fantastic. Thanks. Um, that's done for me. Now I can move on to the next thing. So I think about that. I think about like AR and VR, like yeah. if we're to sort of expand the places where people can have experiences, the documentation has to follow in some way. Uh, it might not look like the documentation looks like today, but perhaps uh, it's all pulled from that single source. So if it shows up while you're in VR hiking on a mountain to find a, you know, to, to see some view or something, or you're, you're, you're exploring how something looks in your house by holding up your phone and seeing it on your shelf, and you don't know what's happening, uh, there should be some some way to have help appear and, and guide you and, and walk you through that. So that's what I mean by like, I think product documentation, self-service and uh, product experience are sort of very closely um, related. Yeah, excellent, Jason. Look, uh, I think you, you've given a bit of a exciting future um, to look forward to where um, definitely content is the key and it gives you that personalized kind of a feel to access the um, the, the help help center. Uh, you were right on the top, uh, right on the ball, where we talked about people uh, these days. The technical way to gauge uh, the effectiveness of the documentation by looking at the how many views they had, how many feedback we received. Uh, but having said that, it is hard to actually measure the impact it actually created. How many people actually used it and did something with it? Okay. And you're right. Um, once you ask the Alexa or something, and then it actually does it on our behalf, taking the approval from us. 
and I'm pretty sure that's an exciting feature to look for um, as well. Yeah, look, look, uh, I'm pretty sure we'll have plenty of time at our hands. You don't need to read the print of you know like documentation to figure it out. Something obviously we'll get it in a few seconds, probably a lot more tailored for us uh, in a language that you can actually understand. Thank you, Silva, and thank you, Jason, for such an insightful presentation. I think the conversations as well as the questions were also equally good. Uh, so I guess uh, our audience are also uh, pretty much enriched with a lot of uh, knowledge that they've got from uh, by listening to you guys. So uh, thank you again, everyone, uh, for attending and being with us for more than a little more than an hour. Uh, so we'll get back to you with another webinar over the next couple of months. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day.